How many have, how many of your kids today have a choice whether you can go to church or not? Or for you bigger kids, did you ever have a choice? No, I didn't either. <laughs> I was on the front row whether I liked it or not. <laughs> but you know, there's there's different things that that try to funnel things our way, and uh, it's different learning styles. Sometimes we're forced to learn. Uh, if I were to say, how many of you enjoyed school? Maybe some of you would, but basically it was a drag for me because I didn't didn't enjoy it. But now. I like learning in a different way. Uh, it's not that school was bad or teachers were bad, it's just that I did not enjoy learning. <laughs> I always had my mind on other things, like having fun or doing something else other than school. But, you know, the, the one thing about it is, is that when you come to church, you either voluntarily come to learn or else you're forced to come. <laughs> Because if you don't show up, maybe your mom and dad would roll over in their grave. Well, think about it. That's why some people go to church. If I didn't go, mom and dad would roll over in their grave. Because it's one of those things that we're trying to force into a, a learning style. And But what, I, what I've learned in my short time on earth is, is uh, God wants me to be hungry for what he has. And when we're hungry for what he has... Then we learn. But he'll never teach you until you want to learn. He'll never force you to learn. He'll never come along and make you follow a funnel of, a funnel effect of, of learning. And uh, the one thing about learning with God is there's so much available. But, once again, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God has no obligation to share anything with you. And I'm going to prove that to you this morning just by the Word of God. Does that mean that He doesn't want you to learn? No, it didn't say that. Just saying, people a lot of times go through life and they do things their own way. They want to get there their own way. They want to do whatever they want their own way. And then all of a sudden a crisis happens. And it's like, God! And sometimes He answers and sometimes He doesn't. But the reality is, is this. God, out of His mercy, may respond to you but God, out of responsibility or out of relationship, will not respond to you because you didn't take the time to build a relationship with Him. And we're going we're gonna to look at that this morning, and there's a lot in this beginning of Proverbs chapter 1, but look at it with me as we read. The proverb of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. Doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. So if you take a look at just that big beginning part, there's two people that are described in, this, in the scripture so far. You've got those that want to come and sit under God and listen to what he has to say. Then you've got those that want to just do their own thing. They don't want discipline. They don't want wisdom. They just want to do their own thing. And they want to enjoy life however they want to enjoy it. And then something, something happens where life brings... Way, something way heavier than we've ever experienced before. So then we don't know what to do. So then we always go back to God. Well, going to God is always a good thing. I don't care what position you're in. But if you want a consistency walk with God, you have to consistently walk with Him. Because out of relationship, I get way more benefit than I do out of just once in a while visitation. Verse 8. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head. <laughs> Think about that just for a second. Has there ever been a classmate of yours or someone in your community that when they act out in the community, you go, yeah, just like their dad, <laughs> or just like their mom? Can you tell who they are? 
Kenny Lundin was two years older than I am, and every time I'd walk into school, he'd say, Little Belden. <laughs> that was my dad's name. I mean, he always called me Little Belden. Well, evidently there were some characteristics and qualities that he saw, or else he just enjoyed giving me a new nickname. I don't know. But there's things that, that grace your head, and uh, sometimes we don't do so well with what's been given us. Because God loves to grace us, which means he gives us the ability to do something we couldn't do by ourselves. He graces us or gives us things to help us live life. But what do I do with that grace? What do I do with the ability that God has given me? What do I do with his word? What do I do with this authority? What do I do with my prayer time? What do I do when I, when I call upon God for healing and miracles and all those things? What do I do? Do I quit because I don't see something? Some people do. But the reality is, is that God never quits. He, his word is faithful. It's a, I love this about God's word. The Bible says his word is an incorruptible seed. That means it doesn't go to waste. It doesn't, it doesn't go to, it doesn't rot. It, it's incorruptible, but it has the power and the potential when it gets in the right ground to do exactly what needs to be done. So your mom and dad's instruction that ga they gave you was to grace you. Um, if I were to put that in everyday terms, my dad graced me with the ability to fix fence. <laughs> Some of you might not see that as a grace ability, but... <laughs> Basically, every time the cows were out, guess who went? So every type of fence fixing that needed to be fixed, I got to watch him do. I walked alongside him. He, we had relationship. So out of relationship, I learned by watching my dad. I learned by watching what he did and, and how he fixed and what he did so that we didn't have to come back and do this again. So he graced me with some ability to do something I didn't have in my own head to do. But I was watching on, on the other side of that corn, he was willing to teach me. <laughs> That's because he always wanted to send me and not him. Yeah. <laughs> I always remember my dad would say, I gotta go to the house, you keep doing this, this, and this, and that was his ability to have lunch without me. <laughs> no, there was always things that he had to do that I had no not need to know, so. He always left me out there, but that was what he was doing. He was gracing my life so he could eventually send me out without having to go with me. So he graced me with the ability to do something I didn't know how to do. And so when, when your mom and dad want to grace your life or have graced your life, they've added something you didn't have. But what do you do with that grace? Do you use it? Do you... Do you um, uh, or do you just set it aside and, and just say, well, you know, I don't need that now. I, I won't do that. I don't, I don't have to do that. Because sometimes we do that when mom and dad gives us instructions. We don't always listen to them, do we? We all have the learning curve of not listening. We all have the learning curve of, of trying to do things our own way without the wisdom and the understanding of those that have gone before us. And today, before we're done, what I want to encourage you to do is this. I want you to find someone in your life that you can begin to meet with on a regular basis to invest what you know into their life. Can you imagine what would happen if every single one of us took one person under our wing in the next year and taught them things that we already know? That God would link you up with someone, God would connect you with someone, that you could gather information from their life, and then they could begin to walk out something that you taught them what needs to be done. Not just in everyday life, but even spiritually. Just think of the atmosphere of our communities and what would happen spiritually if we literally took, uh, um, like, take, let's just take Brad. Brad, you find a, a young man that you can begin to invest in. Every week you meet with him diligently, on purpose, just to invest something into their life. So that they can become something of what you already know. Because here's, here's my dilemma. And you ladies can do the same thing. Here's my dilemma. We have nursing homes full of people of age. That have nobody to invest the knowledge they already have. And I'll be honest with you. How many of you as young people desire to go there? 
and draw it out of them. You see, that's the one thing I think about is I, when I go to the nursing home in Mattville, I look at, a, at a, a range of variety of ages of people. And it's like, where's the young people that would want to draw the knowledge they have of life out of them? To add to their own life so that they can now learn from someone who's gone before them. Am I excited of the fact that I know how to fence? No. But I'm thankful that, you know, for the rest of my life, I'll still have all the memories of how to fix different things just because of what my dad taught me. Now, does that mean I know everything? Not at all. I can always add to that learning. But what, I, what happened was, is out of relationship with my father, I now have something invested in me that even if I don't use it for 20 years, I can still recall it when it's needed. So the reality is, is that there's, there's a part of us that God wants to grace our life. Just as a natural father and mother wants to grace our, our children's lives with different things that helps them get beyond where they are, our Heavenly Father wants to grace your life. He wants to invest in you something you ain't got. Something you can't get any other way outside of relationship. You see, the problem I see with the church in our world today is everybody wants something for nothing. But when it comes down to it, God will not reveal himself unless you will go to him and you long and you desire to get out of him what he already knows and what he has. Most people are frustrated with God because he never talks to them. But if you only talk to your spouse or your kids as much as you talk to God, you probably wouldn't respond to you either. But God wants this constant drawing and this constant sitting by his feet, ready to hear no matter what he had, no matter what season of life it is, no matter what's going on, he wants us to be right with him, to go through life with him, so that when the opportunity comes, he has the ability to invest in me and you that which is needed. And it will gar it'll be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Look at verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay for the harmless, some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and, and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw them into a lot with us and, and we will share a common purse. My son... Do not go along with them. In other words, what he's saying is this. Because this is in a picture of a father-son relationship or a mother-daughter relationship, I want you to think about this. Have you ever done something your mom and dad told you not to do? No. I don't know about you, but there was times when I would go to Arlington and there would be people that would see me and they'd say, you don't act like your mom and dad. Because what they graced me with wasn't what I demonstrated. And we've all done it. So if you and I were to walk out of this church today and someone were to see you, would they be able to tell that God's grace is upon your life or would you be taking God's grace, setting aside only to garland yourself with your own jewelry of, of your own sorts? There, there, there needs to be this distinction between what God has given us or what our Father wants to give us versus what we want to gather ourselves. So he says there's activities that you don't want to invest in. Notice he still calls him his son. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, he says in verse 15. Verse 16, it says, For their feet rush into sin, and they're swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net in full view of all the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood and waylay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. And it takes away the lives of those who get it. Now, watch this next. This next part is really cool. I like this part. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. So here's the deal. <laughs> Let's just pretend Hamer has a celebration tomorrow. 
And it is full of people all over Hamer, as big as it is. And there's people everywhere. There's activities going on. So here's what the scripture says. Wisdom comes out to the streets and begins to speak out wisdom. Okay? All kinds of activity is going on. He says, wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public square. At the, at the head of the noisy street, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. And this is what she says to them. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? In other words, wisdom has been around longer than all of us put together. Because wisdom comes from God. So really, young people, there's no need for you to rewrite the textbook of how to do things wrong. You really should be able to learn off the knobs of somebody else's head. Like if you see somebody with a big old knob on their head, you look at them and say, man, that had to hurt. What did you do? But you know what? Many times we'll walk and do the exact same thing somebody else did, thinking we'll get a different result. The Bible says that if you go down the wrong path, it's going to lead you astray. Bottom line. If you don't walk in the path that God provides, it's going to lead you astray. It has always been that way, and it will always be that way. As long as you and I live, as long as people are alive, there's always a right way to go, and there's always a wrong way to go. And I should be able to watch the lives of those that are before me of which road I should take and which road is too painful to walk. Bottom line. I should be able to, but I'm not always able to do that. So wisdom comes along. And he says, how long will you simple ones love your simple ways? In other words, when he says simple ones, he's not saying you're, you're, you're just plain basic in your understanding. What he's saying is, when he says simple ones, he's saying people that do their own thing apart from God. That's what simple ones love their simple ways. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't care what the cost. I don't care what the price. I'm going to continue to do my own thing. And therefore, because of that, Where's God in the picture? He's not in it. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a second. He says halfway through, How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? So that kind of describes where this, this whole thing with wisdom is coming along. Verse 23 says, If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you. In other words, here's the deal. God in his wisdom has things that he can't wait to reveal or share with you. But if you choose to neglect what God wants or what God needs done, he will withhold that wisdom and let you have your own folly, let you fall into your own way of living, let you experience all the tragedy of doing things your own way. He says, if you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a theory and a thought in, in our world today that God just shows himself to everybody. There's a scripture right there that says he doesn't. And the reason he doesn't share himself with everybody is because there's no intimacy. There's no time with God. There's no listening and, and wanting to hear what he has to say. There's no coming and sitting at his feet and just waiting. I don't care how long it takes for me to hear what God has to say. That when there's no intimacy, there's no birthing, there's nothing that can be brought new into that relationship because there's no intimacy. And that's exactly what happens with wisdom. God says, if... You would have responded to my review. If you would have listened to my voice, if you would have listened to me and turned from your wicked ways and begun to do this, I would have unveiled you. I would have showed you things that you needed to know. But because you didn't, he says this. But since, verse 24, but since you rejected me when I called and no one gave heed when I stretched up my hand, since you ignored all my advice and, and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. <clears throat> what? Does this sound like the God you know? Not really, because we've been told a whole bunch of stuff about God that's really not true. 
God says, if you want to live in your own wisdom and do things your own way, go right ahead. But when disaster comes, I will laugh at you. Because you were foolish enough to think that you could do this on your own. Does that mean that God can't reverse that? Didn't say that. I mean, if God can't reverse it, why did he save Saul? Why did he save any of the... the, 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 the <laughs> any of the fishermen? Why did, he save, why did he save you and I? If that can't be changed, why did he save us? The reality is, is that that's not the destination of where you're going to spend eternity. That's just by saying... I'm not going to choose wisdom. I'm not going to listen to those that have gone before me. I'm not going to learn from someone who I should be able to learn from. I'm not going to build a relationship with someone that I can learn from. And when you choose not to do that, then there becomes this place that you, you, uh, God begins to look and laugh at, at us because of our disaster. He says in verse 26, I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then you will, they will call to me, I will not answer. God doesn't hear every prayer. He doesn't hear every cry. You know why? Because there's no relationship. Now, I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what it says. But once you and I come into relationship and I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life, I now have this relationship where I can go to him and he tells me things and he leads me and he guides me and he teaches me how to respond to his voice in all kinds of situations. Why? Because only when I respond to him and build this relationship with him will I be able to walk like he wants me to walk. So if you have chosen to walk your own way today, do not be surprised that God will not answer you. He just said it right here. When you want to go your own way and all this stuff comes upon you, he says, you will call to me and I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Verse 29. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways. You see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive, receive the fruit of my own decisions. That's just part of responsibility. If, if I choose to go a different way than what God wants, I better be able to handle the consequences of what that brings. But here's the deal with God. Once I give God my life, He now gives me a different way of living, a different way of going about things so I don't make the same mistake I did before I met Him. And once I now begin to walk with him, he begins to grace me. He begins to put a, a crown of a beauty in, instead of ashes. He gives me the oil of joy instead of mourning. I mean, there's, that comes out of Isaiah chapter 61. But, but the reality is, is that God begins to put in me. He graces me with stuff I didn't have before I met Jesus Christ. And he says, verse 32... For the waywardness of the simple will kill them. Doing your own thing will lead you down a dead end road. That's really what it says. God isn't interested in you living your life for yourself anyway. He's interested in you and I living our lives for him. But whoever listens to me, he says in verse 33, will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. God definitely wants to do something in your life and my life. He definitely wants us to, to once again, learn to listen to the, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. He longs, just like a mom and dad long to grace their kids or with a garland and a necklace. And, you know, there's, there's things that um, you'll see kids wearing rings nowadays. And it's like, where did you get that? Well, that's my promise ring. I promise I'd never have sex before marriage. You know, or, uh, or you got a necklace. Oh, this is my grandmother's. You were graced. It wasn't something you earned. You were graced with it. And so when I come to God, now I become graced with His, his power, His authority, His ability to do something I couldn't do by myself. Therefore, because of that, 
Now I can continue to live in such a way and be led by God's Spirit and follow the ways of God's Word that helps me to stay on this track that walks with God. So that when people see me out in everyday life, you see, what we see here today, let's just be honest, most of us have a mask on. We have a mask because we really don't want people to see us who we really are. Sometimes we're very good at hiding that very well. What the reality is, is that God wants us to take that mask off so that we can learn to walk with each other. We can learn to come alongside each other. We can come along and do things together with each other to help each other build and strengthen the work that needs to be done. So God wants us to set this example of learning to hear God's voice, learn to walk in God's ways, learn to do things the way God wants it to do, so that we are graced with a garland and a chain to adorn our neck, like what our mom and dad would give us, that would recognize that, oh, you're from the Capel family, or you're from the Dahl family, or you're from the... I recognize those traits. And God wants to once again recognize the traits of His kingdom in us. He wants us to display the qualities of His kingdom not the displays of my own kingdom. Not the displays of who I am. He wants us to, to, to recognize these qualities that he brings to our life. And the only way that can happen is by absolutely allowing God to do in us something greater than could be done any other way. So what I would encourage you to do this the, today is this. And, I, and I'm not good at this. I'm, it's something I have to grow into. There was a, there's a reason why I love playing sports by myself. Because I didn't have to be responsible for nobody else. To this day, I still hold the discus record at Arlington High. I... It was Mike Nepadol who, I watched, I, I watched it since I was in junior high. Mike Nepadol, 1968 through the discus, 148 feet, 10 inches. Or excuse me, 140, 38 feet, 10 inches. Well, I was at the regional track meet, and I threw the discus, 148 feet, 10 inches. The reality is, is that there, there's, there's things that I completely lost where I was going with that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you for helping me. Uh, but there's a reason why I like doing what I do myself. Because I didn't have to rely on nobody else. Which makes it really hard for me to do what I do today. Because I'd rather do this by myself than have to do it with somebody else to rely on. That's my old nature. The reason I like wrestling because I was the only guy on the map with somebody else. I didn't have to rely on a team. I like playing football, but I didn't like... I, I just like doing things myself because then I didn't have to disappoint... The biggest thing was I didn't have to disappoint anybody else. That's why. If I was a disappointment to myself, no, no problem. But if I was a disappointment to somebody else, I didn't like that. But the one thing about God is, is that what God wants to put in us was never meant just for me. It was meant to be given away. And so now, what my prayer is for my life and for yours is that somewhere in the next year, God would direct you to one person younger than you. That on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you would sit down with them and you would begin to invest in them something God's put in you. I think that's the biggest church growth plan in the world. Because it's not a matter of whether they come to church, it's a matter of how you invest in them on a daily, weekly basis. Now some of you might feel like you're already doing this, and that's great. But to me, there's enough of you older generation here this morning that if you don't have a young person that you can regularly sit down with and say here's what I would do if I were you pull it out of them number one, one don't I should say as an older person be ready to share it with somebody secondly be a young person that would go to them and say 
I want to know what you already know. Let's just admit it, us young ones are not as smart as we think we are. I need all the help I can get, I don't know about you. But if I don't learn to go and gravitate what people already know and learn from that, then what's all that knowledge for anyway? When I go to the nursing home, like I said before, there's a whole bunch of people that have knowledge that needs to be drawn out of them. There's things that they already know and experience we need to know. And uh, unless I, as a young person, am willing to sit at someone's feet and say, I'm not leaving until I get something from you. That's the hard part. Is learning to be the, so diligent that you want to get from somebody what they already know.